Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this maybe sixth, seventh. I'm not sure. We've done quite a few webinars here now at Arthur, uh, but this this webinar is specifically focusing on uh, some of the nascent usage of Gen AI and specifically LLMs that we've seen in the financial landscape. So that's um, FinServe, you know, that's that's big banking and so on as well. Um, and also a brief discussion of some of the, you know, um, the risks that you might encounter, well, not brief, uh, as well as some um, approaches to mitigating that risk. And uh, I'll sort of end this uh, with a brief discussion of some of the legal landscape around the use of Gen AI in highly regulated industries such as, um, well, as, as finance. Um, and I'd like to make this an interactive uh, Q&A, uh, so please do feel free to, when we figure it out, enter things into chat or enter questions into the Q&A. Um, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. And uh, Christina and Sabrina here will also do their best to alert me to their presence. Um, and as a quick intro, I'm John Dickerson. I'm a chief scientist and co-founder here at Arthur. Um, also on lead from a tenured faculty role at the University of Maryland, where I've done a lot of work sort of in the uh, intersection of market design, finance, and, um, and, and machine learning. So this is a space with which I've been familiar um, since sort of before the Gen AI revolution as well. Um, so just a very, very quick uh, summarization of this session. So this is a summarization task. Um, I'll talk about the makings of a present day LLM application. Uh, and this will have a bit of an enterprise focus to it because in the regulated industries, uh, you know, we tend to have a bit of an enterprise focus to things. Um, I'll go over some uh, sort of hot off the presses uh, takes on cloud service providers, uh, the DOD and USG in general, as well as the industry sort of movement in the Gen AI space. And so we'll go through that movement uh, sort of piece by piece uh, by iterating through different uh, uh, elements of a present day LLM application and talking about sort of things that I'm seeing that are working out there, uh, especially in enterprise and highly regulated industries, uh, things that are sort of top of mind for uh, sort of the enterprises and the USG parts of the world, and then things that, uh, that I think are just sort of sorely lacking right now. And so sort of toward the end of this discussion, uh, I'll leave with some open problems uh, and, uh, you know, we can have sort of an open Q&A from there. And so in past webinars that, that I've given here at Arthur or that uh, some of our field data scientists or machine learning engineers have given at Arthur, we've had very vibrant back and forth with the crowd here. Um, I think there's something like 100 to 200 folks who are in the audience live right now. And so like, please do ask questions and also chat with each other when you can. Uh, so just to drive that point home, I am your chatbot here for the next 50 minutes or so. And uh, you're welcome to always follow up or visit Arthur here in New York. So I'd like to start with a biased view, obviously. I'm from Arthur, uh, we're a for-profit company, and so I'll give you our view of what a sort of modal LLM application looks like, and then I'll give a little bit of a peer review from other folks looking at this uh, in the coming slides. But roughly speaking, we can split uh, 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 sort of the modal LLM application that you'll see in enterprise into uh, three layers. So the application layer, that's gonna be what you're interacting with as a human, where we uh, you know, might deal with uh, user prompting uh, or uh, setting up a system prompt to give a particular type type of behavior or handling um, uh, you know iterating uh, uh, through 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 embeddings in a vector database uh, you know using something like a weaviate or a pinecone uh, agents uh, these are basically methods for a human to interact with an LLM based system uh, to 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 input and to receive output from that system. Um, there's an underlying sort of uh, 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 framework or, or basis or structure to an application such as this, which would be observability or monitoring. Um, we offer a product like this. There are open source products like that as well. Uh, users will interact with what I would call the inferencing layer or the generative layer. And so this is where a model is going to be deployed. Uh, could be an open source model, could be a closed source model, could be something that you build internally. This is actually something that we're seeing increasingly, uh, especially with finance customers, uh, is uh, due to sort of regulatory pressure and needing to know exactly what data went into a model, uh, building something internally is becoming a little bit more appetizing. Those will receive input from the user, they'll spit input back out. And then finally, there's, well, which LLM do I use? Or if I'm training an LLM, how do I evaluate it? How do I understand its quote unquote alignment and so on? And so in the development layer, uh, and not everyone's going to be um, uh, uh, able to observe the development layer, right? Like a user of ChatGPT or whatever, uh, typically isn't going to have access to that dev layer that was actually the selection of the LLM that was doing it. But this is a very important component, especially when building models internally, or when, for example, let's say you're using Amazon Bedrock, uh, when doing a multi-select over LLMs and understanding which one you should put into practice. So we have a nice open source product. You're welcome to go and look at it. You know, we're not selling it. It's just an open source, very nice evaluation toolkit called Bench. And then one would worry a bit about just security in general between all these different layers, but especially between the user and the inferencing layer, right? The user's input 
uh, and the received output from these stochastic models that are, you know, uh, doing what they're doing, right? They're doing summarization tests. They're 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 calling out to the raw internet. And so security firewalls, guardrails in that space, for example, Arthur's Arthur Shield product will help to protect both the user as well as uh, the enterprise uh, when it comes to malicious users trying to break a system. And then often, not always, obviously, but often you'll have sort of a chat application on top of this as well. So this might have you know various bells and whistles to receive, for example, human feedback at the application layer, uh, or uh, you know be able to export uh, uh, PDF summaries of, of, of chats uh, so that you can share them with other people, things like that. And so these are becoming a bit commoditized, but this is roughly how we see the landscape. Um, because I'm coming from academia, I like to say things like, well, we should make sure that others feel the way that I do or that, you know, people are, are poking holes in my arguments. So here's a quick sort of peer review. So I've taken this other view of an LLM uh, application. This is from Pinecone, which is a uh, not fully open source vector database, but it's one of the sort of the leading vector databases out there. Um, and they view the, the, the applications for build on LLM slightly differently than we do. There's a bit more emphasis on, uh, for example, agency. There's a bit more emphasis uh, on, uh, well, a bit less emphasis actually on uh, human feedback, which I find to be very important. But roughly speaking, this is the same sort of uh, approach to building an application that, 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 that we presented and I, I just walked through on that previous slide. So uh, just to be unbiased, I'm going to walk through this talk using Pinecone's view of an LLM application, uh, but know that this roughly aligns with sort of what Arthur's seeing out there and sort of our commercial view as well. Um, so I don't know, Christina and Sabrina, are there any questions in chat yet? I believe someone had a comment. Uh, oh, I see some financial services firms block chat on platforms that are not fully integrated into their e-com surveillance. Absolutely. So this is from an anonymous attendee. This is something that we see all over the place, right? And so there were some very famous uh, early cases of, you know, uh, Samsung had one of these, right? Where programmers at Samsung, developers at Samsung uh, were using... Um, is either Copilot or one of the GPTs that's out there to do summarization on, uh, you know, a, a private IP from from Samsung, right? They were they were uploading code from internal code bases on Samsung to a a model that was hosted in, in basically uh, somebody else's cloud, um, and this was bad. Uh, and this has happened a couple of times, and you've seen some of the big providers actually starting to play or try to start playing well with with enterprise, right? You'll have like a um, you know, virtual private clouds where you can spin up your own instance of a particular model and hit against it and not, or you'll see promises, uh, for example, the API access for open AI, you'll see promises that they're not doing any training, at least on the data that you're passing to that. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. This, uh, this, 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 this full integration, this complete like fear of data egress from uh, uh, the privacy of a particular enterprise is something that we see across the board in finance. And I would argue that this will probably potentially drive uh, the adoption of cater fit home built LLMs or open source models that are then fine tuned in internally, but hosted internally as well. But you know, that's an hypothesis. I guess we'll see how that plays out in the next year. Cool. Uh, Vignesh, I'm gonna punt your question uh, until we start talking a little bit more about vector databases in depth. But his, uh, his question is, what would you use a document store instead of a vector database? And I'll argue that those are, those are, those are somewhat, somewhat similar, um, but I'm gonna punt that until we get a little bit further into the, um, into the discussion, but great question. Um, cool. So uh, let's start by looking at this big blue box called LLM, right? So who's out there making LLMs? Where do I get one from? And I'm focusing on LLMs here. You see, I use the acronym FM there as well. This is foundation models. If you want to start doing like multimodal or text to image or so on. Uh, to be blunt, what we're seeing in practice right now is, is almost only text to text outside of in some marketing areas where you'll see a little bit of text to image for creative generation. But in, in FinServe right now, at least we're seeing primarily text to text. So I'll focus on that here. Um, so I'd argue that there's sort of one class of uh, model creator, and these are these generic sort of uh, uh, very large foundation model uh, creators like, um, oops, there we go, like OpenAI, you know, Cohere, Anthropic, uh, Google has has Bard that's out there, um, and uh, MidJourney here, if we want to talk about foundation models, is sort of, sort of a generic text to image model as well. These are uh, typically closed source. 
Uh, they're typically uh, trained on data that uh, maybe you don't know uh, exactly what went into it. You don't know exactly when they're going to change the model and so on. Uh, but you know, if you look at leaderboards or if you just do the gut check of using these, these are typically the models that are performing by far the best, right? And so there's this, uh, and often they're very easy to use as well, right? Like I can send a chat GBT link to my mom and she'll be able to use it. We also have some of these, you know, the big dogs that are out there that are training, uh, but I would say are like specific models, right? Like Microsoft is committing to a strategy of co-pilots across the board, like a Word co-pilot and a PowerPoint co-pilot and so on. And so these are almost like foundation models for that specific uh, piece of software or for that specific ecosystem that they're in, right? Or Quora, Quora um, has, has Poe or uh, Richard Socher's U has a nice uh, 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 semi-generic model that they build into search as well. Um, there are some players that are, uh, you know, training some LLMs for sure, but also sort of in the ecosystem of LLMs. Uh, so Scale AI uh, does uh, uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback as a service, basically. So they're 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 attempting to deal with the alignment aspect of LLMs. Uh, you know, doubling down on like, hey, you have an LLM that's out there, you want to align it for a particular task. How do I get feedback from humans and then feed that into a model to kind of scoot it in the right direction? So these are folks that I would say are like generalists, but they're just in the ecosystem of large language models. Um, Open and open source, or I have air quotes here for open, open source models. These are, these are pretty cool, right? I think these have really driven a lot of the um, fast movement in this space uh, since, well, basically in the last year or so. Um, you know, Stability AI was sort of one of the, 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 the big players uh, here in text to image uh, with Stable Diffusion when it came out. Uh, Meta has really like tripled down on the idea of open sourcing models. Uh, which is, um, you know, from a personal point of view, I'm very into this. So like Jan LeCun and, and team over there are doing a great job of putting out large models. So if you've heard of Llama, the various Llama families of models are coming out through them. Um, Mistral uh, is, a, is a more recent uh, upstart, which has some of the strongest performing open small models that are out there. Um, and then we have, you know, a variety of others, you know, Mosaic famously acquired by Databricks. Uh, a lot of open tooling, but the many of the models they train are going to be for individual enterprises. So I wouldn't call them open. But this is sort of a, a, a frenemy relationship, I would say, with the uh, with the uh, with the closed source big providers that are out there. And you see, I have air quotes around open here. This is a, an interesting discussion on the internet, right? If I just share the weights of a model, most people would call that an open source model. And I think there's a strong argument that that shouldn't actually be called open because you know I don't know exactly how that model was created, right? Like I wouldn't be able to recreate that model, even if you gave me the code that was used to train it without actually having access to, for example, the entire data pipeline, right? Without having the ability to look at all the data that went into it, how it was cleaned, how it was curated, uh, you know, how exactly it was trained um, uh, uh, and so on. And so when it comes to open source models, I think these are, you know, a step in openness, but for most of these, you wouldn't actually be able to recreate them, even if, even if you, you know, downloaded the weights and, and, and have the code that they used to train it. And then finally, I'd say there are a couple other classes of players here, and you know they've been a little bit more more opaque over 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 the last year or so. But I'm going to have some quotes from the DoD and USG uh, about LLM creation in the coming slides. Nation states obviously are building their own uh, language models, but we'll be a little bit more opaque about sharing information about them. Um, you know, you've seen a lot of action, for example, yesterday at the White House and. Uh, you know, treating uh, the development of these large language models as, uh, uh, well, something that sits in our defensive and offensive capabilities as a country. Um, and from what I've been reading, most countries view it as that way as well. So we're going to see a tight coupling of uh, nation states with large providers. We're also going to see nation states training these internally as well. And there's, there's evidence that the U.S. especially is doing that already. And then finally, for this web webinar, um, yeah, Arthur's worked with many regulated uh, big co's, uh, so you know, health insurance or or big banks uh, over the years, and we still do. Um, regulated big co's are going to start uh, training their own models as well. This is a, a a bit of a prediction on my part, but also like there's evidence that this is happening. Bloomberg has Bloomberg GPT openly, um, and many of the C-suite at large banks in the U.S. have at least said that they're planning to trade uh, their own internal models. And some of the reasoning for this is uh, what was got mentioned by this anonymous attendee earlier, right? Which is like, there, 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 there's a lot of security concern around LLMs. And it's not just where the LLM is getting hosted or how it's being interacted with. It's also, I wanna know how the thing was trained. Uh, you know, I wanna, I wanna be able to poke holes in it in, spe in a specific way, or maybe for a particular task, I can get away with a much smaller model trained on my own data with my internal data science teams, uh, which will end up being cheaper, lower latency, et cetera, than using one of these large generic models. 
right? And so this is an open area of discussion, both in, both in research as well as in industry. Uh, this was the bet that Databricks made when it acquired Mosaic, right? Is that they're going to want to build out internal models for enterprise clients. Um, and I think we'll see how that plays out over the coming years, but it certainly is being more than discussed uh, at the C-suite level in, in many regulated industries. So uh, as always, uh, please do uh, argue with me about how you see the environment here, but this is roughly how I would see the LLM ecosystem for that big blue box there in, um, in Pinecone's view of how the, the ecosystem looks like. Now, I wanted to touch uh, 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 on this executive order that came out yesterday. So today is October 31st. Uh, the Biden administration put out an executive order on trustworthy AI uh, literally yesterday, which is a very interesting read. It's probably one of the toothiest uh, top-down sort of paternalistic government-issued trustworthy AI uh, documents that's out there right now, um, I would say internationally even. So it's pretty interesting to see this come out. Um, we'll see how it evolves over time. You know, this is an EO, so it's going to be a request basically for funding to back it up. It, um, uh, you know, it talks about a lot of things like um, uh, uh, fairness and bias, uh, 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 landlords using AI uh, for, for appropriate reasons, defense, obviously, uh, bioterrorism. It's a very sort of sweeping uh, top-down discussion of some of the risks that are seen out there in the AI space right now. And so I do encourage people to, to take a look at that. But in terms of the LLM ecosystem, like the creators of the LLMs, I just wanted to flag one quick paragraph in that, right? So this is uh, verbatim from the EO. Uh, they were interested in promoting a fair, open, and competitive AI ecosystem by providing small developers. So that would be not open AI, right? That could be somebody like, um, like an upstart small lab or a startup and entrepreneurs, access to technical assistance and resources. So nebulous, but you know, um, GPUs are expensive. And so giving access to GPUs, that, that could be interesting. Helping small businesses commercialize AI breakthroughs. So this, this all sounds good. And then there's an interesting end to this. So they're encouraging the FTC to exercise its, its authorities, right? And so this is um, what I mean a, a bit by it being a little paternalistic and top down. This is an evergreen topic in, in the US is you know what role should the FTC play in breaking up monopolies? I won't say my own opinion here. Um, obviously, monopolies are not great, um, but it'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the LLM ecosystem because there truly are some some very large large players right now where it's it's almost impossible to compete with them at the model sizes that they're training. And so, if the FTC starts waking up there, you know, I, I view this as a bit of a double edged sword, as it always is. Um, but it's interesting to see this called out in in this EO from yesterday. And so, it'll be interesting to see how that 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 changes the um the the landscape of who 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 is building models. Cool. So I mentioned, you know, training in-house or should I just fine tune in-house, which is, uh, you know, I take a model that somebody else built and then I'll do a little bit of extra work to fine tune it in a particular way. Or, you know, should I just call out to open AI? This is a discussion that happens across the board. It's a discussion that is a function of cost, latency, uh, and also um, obviously um, uh, like data governance rules. So I'll just have a quick quote from uh, um, uh, a C-suite at, at, at a large bank that was given in the last couple of months. So we'll be deploying 15 to 20 Q&A chat apps across the firm in the next month. Uh, right now, they're all based on ChatGPT. So these are you know, VPC based, um, but we're planning to move to task specific models and are exploring building from scratch. That is a year or more out though. And uh, just summarizing the discussions that I've had with various various uh, folks in, in, in FinServe and banking, this is roughly what we're seeing out there right now. People are able to prototype very quickly using something like an open AI or something like a Cohere. Uh, but uh, as was mentioned in chat, um, folks in general don't think that that's going to be sort of the end all be all of model development, right? So they think that they're gonna be able to get away with higher performance, lower cost, lower latency using task specific models. Uh, and they think that they might just be regulated into using task specific models that they trained in house as well. So, you know, keep your eyes out uh, open for the next say 12 months or so in this space. It'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Cool. So uh, we talked a little bit about LLMs. I wanted to talk a bit more about LLM evaluation. So this is the idea that, you know, I give you a set of LLMs and I ask you to, um, you know, on a variety of different dimensions, understand where they work well, where they work poorly. And then at the end of the day, make a, de a decision basically to use one or maybe to use a few of these, these models that are out there. Um, and I, this, is, this is a very, very difficult problem, right? Evaluation of just machine learning models in general or automation in general, stochastic systems in general is very, very tricky. 
Um, there has been a lot of work in open source around benchmarks, right? And this is from the pre-LLM days as well, like just benchmarking different tasks in natural language processing. And there are a lot of strong opinions about this as well. So there are some sort of tried and true uh, 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 methods for benchmarking natural language tasks, like glue and super glue, for those of you who work in this space, that's been around for a while. Uh, a quick shout out to Stanford, which has a nice project called Helm, which you can imagine this is just a giant for loop over basically every metric uh, and every uh, data set or benchmark that's out there and most of the major models that gets updated from time to time and then doesn't provide an opinion about what's good and what's bad for a particular task, but basically gives you a giant like tensor or a giant table of how these models are performing on particular uh, sort of academic benchmarks. And so it's a really interesting site. Uh, we see this referenced a lot in practice. Uh, I think it's very hard to discuss results from Helm with folks who aren't really, really down in the trenches working on particular apps. Like if you wanted to talk to uh, an SVP or somebody in a C-suite, it's often hard to walk through uh, results from Helm just because it's 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 so much data that's just presented to you without an opinion. Uh, Google has results in this space, Eleuther, uh, OpenAI, and so on. There's, there's a lot of work in this space. I'd say that there's a dearth. This is a, just a comment from, from my own, an opinion, basically. There's, there's, we're lacking as a community LLM specific evaluation data sets, right? So something you'll hear a lot about in the LLM space is, uh, uh, you know, tracking for intrinsic or for extrinsic hallucinations. And uh, it's very, very difficult to build a general hallucination detector, right? And so, uh, the existence of task specific say hallucination data sets or task specific prompt injection data sets or task specific sensitive data you know uh, uh, data sets and so on um i think this is this is very very important for 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 evaluating llms because at the end of the day you're going to be using uh this in your llm application you're going to be using this model for a particular task or you're going to hope that your your users are using it for a particular task and so you should be caring about its performance on that task in different ways oh i see a cue <laughs> yeah, there's a uh, cheeky comment from anonymous attendee. <laughs> uh, for those who want to have a fun little read, pre-training on the test set is all you need. Now, this is a discussion of uh, some of the issues that have that have happened when when training large models. Um, I won't get into that in this in this discussion. <laughs> cool. So I do think that this is a good place for startups uh, and for open R and D teams at big companies to differentiate. Right. So if you're right now sitting at uh, well even a hedge fund, right, where you have a particular uh, specialization in a particular vertical, putting some time into putting together a particular evaluation data set for, let's say you're doing a summarization, like a talk to data task to um, uh, to summarize financial documents and then make trading decisions off of those summaries, putting some, some time specifically into developing evaluation data sets on the kind of data that you tend to see is absolutely going to be worth it to you either if you want to open that up to the community or if you want to internally have an edge over your competitors. This is something where the, 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 the big players really aren't playing. And this is something where, um, you know, we internally at Arthur, for example, create a lot of our own data sets as well for this very reason. Um, like I mentioned, we have this open source evaluation uh, 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 toolkit that was put together at Arthur called Arthur Bench. That's the QR code here, completely open source. Please do feel free to add um, benchmarks or metrics into that. We've tried to take a little bit more of a human-centered focus when putting that into, uh, uh, into, uh, in, into development. And the reason we've taken a bit more of a human-centered focus is because even though there's been all this work in benchmarking and metrics and trying to do you know, A-B testing of LLMs and so on, you hear this constantly, uh, and I still believe it's true. Uh, the selection of an LLM is really just a gut check, right? Like if you use a version of ChatGPT a month ago versus say today, uh, people don't really trust the metrics talking about, hey, it improved in this particular way. Instead, it's it's sort of like how you feel interacting with the system. And there's still a lot of elements of that that are out there right now. You get around that a little bit by actually talking to receiving feedback from uh, implicit and explicit feedback from humans when they use the system and from doing these extremely task specific evaluation data sets but you know it's not a panacea by any means this is a this is very much an evergreen problem so i mentioned that i wanted to bring in some discussions about usg and dod as well right like um the the dod doesn't agree with industry in the us in every possible way but it, it does certainly face many of the same issues and so here are some screenshots from and these are public screenshots you know totally unclassified and so on um some screenshots uh, from a recent presentation from the CDAO uh, announcing sort of the launch of what they're calling Project Lima, which is a, a method to sort of understand and evaluate uh, LLM applications. 
And the language they use in these slides is almost identical to the kind of language that I use in commercial presentations, I use in academic presentations, and that we see when we go into presentations, uh, with especially with regulated industries. Uh, a, evaluation is really, really hard. Uh, B, it's very, very important. Uh, C, you see this here at the bottom, that benchmark performance has to be use case specific. And then D, that at the end of the day, what really matters is evaluating the human LLM team or the application itself, right? So a lot of these metrics on LLMs, we'll talk about, say, a benchmark data set and a single model. And uh, you'll get some, some metrics that come out of that. Uh, and then you can kind of horse race different LLMs. But at the end of the day, that model, just like in, in, in anything in machine learning, right? That model is part of a larger system where humans are interacting with it. There's some sort of downstream impact. You know, there, there, there's drift and some, some upstream data sources and so on. Maybe the type of user is changing over time. And so that evaluation, and the DOD is saying this here, we see it all the time in industry as well. That evaluation has to be a function of the entire system, right? So it has to be getting human feedback. You have to be tracking downstream impacts of the, the outputs from that system on whatever stakeholders are downstream and so on. Um, and again, this is going to be an evergreen project because the way you do that is going to be task specific as well. So it's good to have opinions on general ways to do this, but this is something we're seeing across the board, regulated industries, uh, the rest of uh, our commercial customers, uh, DOD and USG, um, and uh, obviously in startup land, um, it's gotta be about the entire system. It's not just about the individual model, which is not to say the individual model doesn't matter, right? Like latency matters, cost matters and so on. But at the end of the day, when you make that selection, it's gotta be about the whole system. Um, cool. So uh, vector databases were brought up in a question a little bit earlier. I'd like to do a quick intro to uh, the usage of these in uh, modern LLM applications. I think for many of you, you will have seen this before, but I'd like to make sure that we're all on the same footing here. And then I'll talk about some of what I'm seeing out there in vector DB land. So uh, often you want to access external knowledge bases. You see it here in this pinecone picture. They have you know external knowledge bases that they want to bring into an LLM system. And why is this such a hot thing right now? Well, let's remember that GPT stands for Generative Emphasis on Pre-trained Transformer Models. Uh, what that means is it's a fixed model, right? Maybe it's being updated from time to time by the model server. But like if you train a model today, it's not going to change ever again unless you, you input new information into it. So it's a fixed model that takes as input a prompt and maybe some other stuff. Uh, and it provides some sequence of tokens as a response. Okay. Uh, yeah, these prompts and responses are currently upper bounded in size. You'll see things called the context window, right? This is a big deal when this gets expanded because it allows you to ingest uh, greater inputs to your model. That input could be, you know, an example could be like pushing the entire Great Gatsby into your model, or it could be allowing you to put in more financial data into the model. Uh, this is an active area of research. Um, there are a couple of models coming out right now that are claiming things like infinite con context window sizes. Um, I think that's a little bit of marketing, uh, but we're seeing a lot of a lot of a lot of emphasis on growing this over time. But there's no addition. I want to come back to RAG. There's no additional learning over time, right? Which is to say, uh, if I look at my LLM application, let's say that I'm I'm using uh, I think ChatGPT um, was uh, trained up through January 2022 or something like that. And I ask a question about something that maybe should be in its training data, right? And maybe I ask, what was the largest stock exchange by market cap in the world in 2021? And you see it gives this response that it's the New York Stock Exchange, uh, along with a lot of hedging language, uh, which I think is right, right? So that's great. But let's say that I want to ask a different question, something more recent, right? What's the largest stock exchange by market cap in the world uh, today? Okay, so there's no reason why that well, it would be. It would be surprising to me if that data were in uh, the January 2022, 2022 trained chat GPT. And so what's going to happen when you ask a question like this to a model is one of a couple of things, right? One is it's just going to give you a response, right? It's going to give you basically a hallucinated response, uh, which is probably not right. Or two is, you know, if you were to do this with uh, any of the major, you know, the bards of the chat GPTs of the world, it's going to give you hedging language like, well, this is outside of my training window. So what do you want to do if you want to use a natural language system that queries uh, uh, well, present data, right? There's a couple of ways to do this. Um, one of the sort of traditional ways in, in machine learning land would be to fine tune the model, right? So that is to say, uh, bring in some properly formatted, more recent prompt completion pairs, right? Like, uh, yeah, um, I just, I go through, I curate some data, I bring that in, and then I train against it for a bit longer. So this is very good. Like this is actually a very useful thing to do. Uh, I wouldn't advise doing it, you know, every day or something like that. But if you want to change the model's base behavior, 
this is a very, very useful thing to do. But there's a couple of problems here. Like one is it's time consuming to come up with prompt completion pairs, right? I have to have somebody who sits down there and makes sure that they're all correct. Uh, it's also uh, adding more new data is gonna require another fine tune, right? Well, let's say that I wanna ask for the largest uh, stock exchange by market cap in the world on November 1st, then I might have to do this again if I'm following this particular path. And that's gonna be very expensive. So one thing one can do instead is, well, hey, what if I want to do Q&A on private data? What if I want to do this sort of querying without having to touch my base model every single day? Well, I can lean on traditional information retrieval systems and connect them with pre-trained models. So that's pretty exciting. This is something called retrieval augmented generation, or RAG, you often hear it called. This consists of two basic steps. One is you're going to do a retrieval step where you're going to query some database uh, for documents, or you're going to query it for, um, uh, well, chunks of documents to find relevant inf information. And the nice thing about this is if you have private data, let's say you're in finance, you're at a big bank, and you have an, uh, an IB arm, uh, and you have a trading arm, right? You have like an M&A, an IB arm, and you have a trading arm. Uh, if you mix the data that these two teams have together, you're going to be breaking a lot of laws, right? Because you're going to end up with insider trading, you're going to end up with market manipulation, and so on. And so this is one of the, the key areas for performing... Um, uh, one of the early checks on sensitive data leakage or improper data leakage is to make sure that you have proper role-based access control uh, on, on the vector DDB, uh, on the database or data store or document store itself, right? It's going to check to see if John should even have access to this particular document and then not return that if so. That's one of many checks one should do when doing this sort of thing. You can also do uh, checks on the egress of the output from the LLM itself, but not putting that private data into this in the first place is, is, is going to be a good gut check for sure. The second step after retrieving uh, is generation, right? And so this is going to be an augmentation step uh, where we take that retrieved information. Uh, maybe we change a prompt uh, that was passed in or the query that was passed in by the user. We edit this in some sort of way, and then we ask the system again for a final response. So I'd like to walk you through that a little bit more blatantly. Um, again, this is sort of a high-level overview of how this happens. So uh, we have a system prompt, and then we have a query from the user. So this is on the application layer. That's going to hit some LLM or an LLM application, right? It's going to hit internal big bank code chat AI. A query will go out, and that um, uh, will be able to, to query for similar uh, 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 bits of private information that is stored in some sort of private data store. And this could be traditional information retrieval over a document store, or this could be some sort of embedding-based search over a vector database. Uh, we've seen both in practice. That search is going to return one or more uh, pieces of information that I can then do a number, another summarization step on if I want to, or I can just pass back as raw information and include that in with my prompt and my query to a uh, new call, right? You see down here a prompt query and whatever this new context is, calling into a new model, just ask for maybe a summarization with this new private data in it, that then gets passed back to my LLM application. Maybe I do something additional to that, where I do some summarization, or I do some sort of, I don't know, private data um, uh, uh, screening, and then that finally gets returned to the user. So in a very sort of simple nutshell, this is what rag based uh, retrieval augmented generation rag-based systems look like. And these are, across the board, uh, one of the top of mind uh, uh, ways to incorporate private data into applications that we're seeing. Um, So I just want to do a little bit of chatting about sort of the, the state of the art in this space. Um, oh, sorry, I missed a couple of questions here. Uh, had to join late. Will a recording be available? Yes, yeah, yeah. We'll definitely be posting this, I believe, on YouTube. Uh, would catastrophic forgetting also be a problem for fine tuning? Absolutely, Vignesh. Yeah, absolutely. If I find, yeah, I mean, you'll have the various types of mode collapse or, or forgetting that, that, that occur here as well. Yeah, yeah. So deciding, for example, how many of those prompt completion pairs you feed in during the fine tuning pass, uh, is just like, a, like it has traditionally been in, in machine learning uh, since before um, uh, sort of this revolution. Um, it's, it's a bit of a qualitative and quantitative experience, put it that way. Um, so we're seeing RAG everywhere. Um, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, there's a lot of options out there if you want to lean specifically on using a vector database for this. Uh, there are some open source options. Um, uh, WeV8 is one, I, probably the leading open source option. Um, there are some uh, non-open source options. So Pinecone is an example of this. There are some legacy players in the information retrieval space that are really starting to double down on building projects here. Uh, so Elasticsearch, I think, is a great example of this. So many of you have probably used Elasticsearch uh, in, in your own lives. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're rolling a, um, a vector database as well. 
and they have a huge huge advantage here in the sense that like the the retrieval step right uh is 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 very hard information retrieval is um you know it's not a new area to be in and they have a lot of experience in there um and then finally uh, for example, when I wrote, wrote my own sort of uh, fun little demos that are using using RAG uh, to hit private data, say on my own computer, um, I don't even use a vector database, right? Like for many use cases, you can get away with just like a giant pandas uh, like data frame or a giant NumPy array full of embeddings. And like, that's kind of the dirty secret of the space, just like with databases in general, right? Like people tend to lean on like SQLite for pet projects uh, instead of, you know, spinning up uh, a DDMS or whatever. Uh, for a lot of pet projects here, which is by the way, a lot of the LLM ecosystem right now, uh, you can just get away with using like a one-liner in Python for this and then doing just like a linear search over your embeddings. Um, you know, jury is out on if that's going to change over time. This is something that people like to brush under the rug. Um, so one thing that I think will be really interesting to watch in the in the coming couple of years is whether these new players like Louis V8 and Pinecone and so on can beat out the incumbents that have been thinking about information retrieval for so very long. Um, a lot of the open, and the reason I say this is because a lot of the open problems are similar to traditional open problems in information retrieval. So these newer players, they have great teams, they're putting out great products, you know, they're leveraging the open source community, but a lot of what they have to do to make a good IR system is just to, you know, relearn 10 years or 15 years or 20 years of information retrieval. And so I think, you know, once the elastic searches of the world wake up to this, it's going to be an interesting competitive space. What do I mean by that? Well, things like similarity search, right? Like what... How do I how do I how do I define a distance metric over different embeddings or uh, how do I um, uh, incorporate human feedback to learn or to change my distance metric over time to learn that maybe it was wrong in a particular way right that's not a new question uh, for for LLM land that's something that's been around for a long time or the speed at which one does search right I shouldn't just be iterating through every different embedding like I just said except for all my pet projects uh, there's a lot of uh, work in optimization here. Uh, adding and deleting documents, right? Like, let's say that I want to update a document. I want to add in uh, today's new information uh, that the SEC reported on, on X, Y, or Z. How do I do that in an efficient way? How do I verify that the data in my data store is right, right? If I do great retrieval of incorrect data, uh, how do I, A, detect that that's happening, B, and B, mitigate that that's happening, right? I can have very, very bad data, a great search process, and the end user experience is going to be very bad. You know, garbage in, garbage out, I think would be the, the, the cheeky way of saying that. There are some new uh, or old, but now much more important open problems in this space as well. So chunking documents, like fitting documents, you know, if I if I have a giant financial document, I probably don't want to embed that as a single like vector in my vector database. I probably want to chunk it up in some particular way, maybe with some sort of overlaps. So when I do the retrieval process, I'm able to maybe more efficiently or more targeted retrieve information. Uh, to be blunt, what we're seeing in terms of chunking in practice right now is just absolute bare bones, naive chunking, right? You're going to chunk a thousand tokens at a time or something like that. Um, there's a lot of gain to be had in different chunking strategies for sure. Uh, embedding functions might change as well, right? Like if I am using OpenAI embeddings and they change the model, uh, how do I update my database without, for example, doing uh, re-embedding all the inputs? Or maybe I have different versions for, for embeddings. Uh, maybe I have some sort of distance function mapping between, between the different versions. Um, not a new problem, uh, but certainly very, very important now that we're using models, or a lot of people are using models that they don't really control, right? They're, they're using models that somebody else is updating uh, on their own. Uh, finally, evergreen problem in IR, but this is actually, I, I would say, uh, arguably more important now, is to return a diverse but good set of chunks, a diverse but good set of information from that vector database, right? Because what are you doing with the information that gets retrieved from, say, a vector database, where you're using that to basically form a new prompt uh, that you'll then send into, uh, augmented by, by the user's input as well, right? You'll send that into an LM system. And uh, the more concise you can be, the more the more the more information you can pack into like a concise, uh, basically augmented summary of, of, of what you're retrieving from the vector database. Um, in many cases, at least, the better your response is going to be from that final LLM, right? A fewer tokens means you're going to have a much faster sort of response time. Inferencing is going to be shorter. Uh, it's going to be less expensive. Uh, and, uh, you know, if I get a bunch of overlapping results back, I'm going to be able to compress that down a lot, but maybe I should have spent a little bit more time getting a diverse coverage such that when I compress it, I have more information in the compressed uh, uh, prompt. And so this, again, is going to be an area where I think task-specific differentiation is going to be a big thing, as well as human-specific feedback on the kind of documents that get, re that get retrieved. 
Um, oh yeah, and, and a bunch of other sort of newer things like sequential query and cha chaining, stuff like that. So these these have been around for a while as well, but they're, they're becoming very, very, um, I see fewer of them in practice so far, but that I think is just because we're still six months out. They're, 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 these are a big part of a lot of the cool demos you'll see, you'll see a lot in, uh, in, in chat GPT land. Um, great. So let's keep going through this uh, ecosystem. Um, you'll see folks talking about external code execution or plugins or, or or the use of agents, right? And I'm kind of lumping these all together. I know this is a little bit, um, you know, not 100% correct, but you know, this is a this is a short talk. So I will say the following. Uh, the idea of an agent isn't new, right? This idea of an agent is something that's been discussed, you know, since the genesis of modern artificial intelligence, right? Like since the late 50s with Dartmouth conference and so on. Agency, this idea that you can perceive the world, you can reason about it, you can learn from uh, the outputs of your actions, uh, that's not a new concept, right? Um, but uh, I think a couple of new things are happening here. One is the interaction with these agents via natural language is making them uh, much more easy to, uh, well, to build, build small products off of. Uh, and two is um, uh, just the increase of compute right now. Uh, and the increase of sort of the open source community at building out really cool uh, single agent or multi-agent simulators um, has increased the usage of these, at least in, in, in cool demos that I've seen so far, right? So basically how does like a modern agent get launched? Well, you're gonna launch code that has some sort of task, right? Uh, plan a vacation. And it's gonna have some constraints in an objective function to try and achieve that task. So the constraints could be something like you can't spend more than a thousand dollars. You have to do this in less than 10 steps uh, and uh, you can only use Google. Uh, and the objective function is going to be something that penalizes, for example, uh, total travel time and uh, and the cost of uh, uh, of the trip, right? Um, and maybe some other sort of catastrophic thing, like did you actually go to the right place? And you know, did um did the plane tickets that you bought actually uh, uh, create a cycle, or something like that? And agents are going to have this uh, typically given to them as as explicit definition. There's a lot of cool work right now at, at trying to learn these as well, and they're going to be able to take one or more actions to achieve that goal. Right, and then they're going to achieve accrue cost over time, right? So this is not a new paradigm, but uh, the ease at which we have access to these agents now, and sort of the speed at which they can access external information and act uh, in a virtual world, uh, has has created a sort of cool e ecosystem for the creation of these sorts of products. So my guess is we'll keep seeing this, uh, especially external code uh, execution uh, and and sort of the, the plugins that you've, you've sort of played around with. But uh, moving forward, things like full, full blown agents. Uh, into rag-based applications. I think this is very, very powerful when it comes to search. Uh, I think it's very, very powerful, obviously, when it comes to things like personal agents that can do things like travel planning or uh, you know planning a dinner, that kind of thing. Um, and I think it's going to be very, uh, very, very important when it comes to, especially in, 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 in finance, querying structured data, right? Uh, just raw large language models right now are pretty bad at understanding tabular data in the sense that uh, you'll still see them getting tripped up with like handling a row versus a column. You know, very, very basic stuff. Um, and there's a lot of work going into making that better. But uh, there's, you know, a lot of evidence that we should be using LLMs as part of a larger system to be able to deal with um, uh, 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 structured data as well. Um, so, you know, as Excel rolls out its copilot, it'll be very interesting to see how, how they handle some of this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, my, my TLDR here is basically it's still very, very early days on the use of agents in production applications. Um, it's very, very easy to see cool demos using them, but uh, I've seen a lot of sort of pain points when it comes to putting these into prod, which is basically that, that these multi-agent systems, being able to monitor them, put guardrails around them, ensure the security and so on, a uh, very, very open question right now. And so I'm curious if anybody here has uh, actually seen an agent-based system in production in an enterprise versus as a cool demo. Like if you have, like, I would love to hear about that either privately or in the Q&A. Um, I think it's early days. I think there's a lot of promise here. I'm super bullish on it, but I just haven't seen it yet. Uh, so you've heard me use this phrase firewall or guardrail or Arthur Shield uh, throughout this talk. This is a big, big pain point for everyone you talk to in enterprise. Uh, it's top of mind. So the idea is basically, I want to have some sort of uh, detector and mitigator that is wrapped around either the user experience or the LLM itself, which is protecting my firm 
from negative impacts of like prompt injection or sensitive data leakage, protects the user from negative impacts of my system in general, right? Like I don't want my system to spit out toxic content. Um, and uh, it's gonna give me like legal CYA as well, right? And so this is a really interesting space to be operating in right now. It's one that we have as a company have moved into a bit more into the security space recently with Arthur Shield. Um, there's some cool open source projects out there that are that are sort of more generalist uh, and much like everything else, I would say you really wanna do task specific detectors and mitigators as well. Uh, but things like, uh, you know, NVIDIA put out email guardrails. There are closed source options that AWS, for example, has put out around its Titan family of models. OpenAI has uh, obviously spent a lot of time doing toxicity detection and stuff like that as well. So again, evergreen topic in this space, but it's one where, you know, even if you're not a big player, you can really differentiate on the task specific specificity itself. And I would encourage folks to do that, right? Like lean on your data science teams, lean on your domain expertise to be able to build out specific uh, detectors for, you know, whatever hallucination uh, that are going to be able to outperform some of these generalist solutions. Um, there's an interesting frenemy, what I would call frenemy relationship between the big LLM players here, like an open AI and the cloud service providers, like a Microsoft, or the big LLM players like uh, Cohere and cloud service providers like uh, AWS, for example, right? Like, let's dive into that AWS example. Uh, they have something called Bedrock that just went into GA, which allows you to basically multi-select over um, uh, open source models uh, to um, uh, put them into prod, right? It's going to be, you know, playing around in the AWS ecosystem, or maybe you'll be able to use Jumpstart within SageMaker to do this. Um, AWS is hosting other people's models, right? They're also training their own models. Microsoft, for example, puts a ton of money into OpenAI, pushes OpenAI real hard, but they are also training their own co-pilots across the board, right? Which in some sense will compete with OpenAI. That sort of frenemy relationship uh, is interesting. It also exists between startups and between big co's and the CSPs. At the end of the day, right, like the big LLM players are trying to provide models that are quote unquote good uh, for some various values of good. Those might be different for you. Those might be different for, for example, Microsoft's Excel Copilot, right? Good is going to change. And I don't mean just good in the social sets. I also mean good in like the, maybe you have an SLA, which says you have to get a response in like 0.1 millisecond, uh, well, not 0.1 seconds, right? It's going to be hard to use an open AI based model for that. Um, the big LLM players, and to some extent the CSPs as well, don't really drill down into these specific use cases or specific user needs when it comes to firewalls. And so I really think this is a cool place to differentiate. It's one where we're differentiating ourselves, but I think if you have internal data science teams, uh, you can really differentiate here as well. You, you, can, you can beat the pants off of these large providers because they're explicitly trying to be generalists. Um, yeah, but still, uh, just like with, with hallucination detection, um, security around uh, any sort of automation, security around traditional machine learning, security around LLM, security around you know foundation models that, that continue to go into prod, that's going to have to continue evolving. It's going to be in a sort of endless game of cat and mouse where it's understanding end user requirements, it's understanding responses to new styles of attacks, uh, and so on. And so I think this is an exciting and, and another sort of like evergreen space uh, 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 to explore. Oh yeah, so calling back out, you know, I don't want to just give you my biased view. So here is a, a, a publicly uh, part of the USG or DOD's view on this. Um, they're, they're extremely interested in a, 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 a task specific software for doing evaluation and for doing live checks against things like harm, veracity of claims and so on. So again, we hear this in enterprise, you hear this with cool demos, you hear this in, uh, you know, like B2C and you hear this, although it's often less public, you hear this coming from USG as well. So I guess in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to just quickly go through a couple of sort of other uh, uh, areas uh, to focus on in this space. So one is going to be prompt engineering, right? So this is still just like evaluation, I would say, going to be a bit of a gut check, right? There's some cool stuff that's coming out, like chain of thought or tree of thoughts, which are giving a little bit more structure to the ability to uh, sort of automate, in this case, internally responses that can help verify claims from a particular user input. There are automated methods. Here's one that uh, 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 sort of leans on evolving prompts over time against a particular reward function. I think this came out of DeepMind. Um, and there are products that can help you understand the evolution of your prompts over multiple durations. So your data science team is changing, say their prompt over time, and you want to see whatever latency responses or various metrics on that. But the ability to sit down and write the quote unquote optimal prompt for a particular task or to iterate your way toward that is still a bit of a gut check. It's still a little bit guess and check. And so this is a pretty cool area to, to, to be in right now. 
And I will say, uh, I'm, I'm putting prompt injection here under prompt engineering, because it is, in this case, an adversarial user trying to engineer an input to your system to uh, leak your system prompts or to jailbreak your LLM or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's been a lot of very interesting automation work in the attack space here uh, recently. Um, and this is actually mimicking a lot of the adversarial machine learning work that's happened over the years as well, where the attack side is almost always uh, sort of on, uh, well, almost always in the lead. I'd argue that the attack side is in the lead here on LLMs as well. So this is going to continue being an endless game of cat and mouse, uh, I think endless, at least for the foreseeable future. And then finally, chat apps, like a lot of the, to be blunt, like almost everything that we're seeing in fraud right now is, is a chat app. So it'll be like some sort of summarization or some sort of generic Q&A. Um, there are concerns around conversational memory or like dialogue-based systems. Uh, in like what I would say are consumer-based chat apps, I think longer context windows are actually going to address a lot of this, right? So there's uh, like Anthropic has a 100K context window that's out there. Uh, that's a lot of tokens, right? Like most classic books are fewer than 100,000 tokens using a standard tokenizer. Uh, there are obviously issues with performance as you increase the context window size. There are arguments about the efficacy of doing that. There are arguments about the quality of the response that you get. But again, this is extremely active research. And so I think this is going to get better very, very quickly. But for this crowd, finance is a bit of an outlier here, right? So when we talk to folks in finance and when we talk to folks in, in legal, uh, context windows need to be huge, right? You all know what documents you're reading. They're extremely wordy. The idea of being able to put like a raw, you know, stack of documents into, uh, in, into a model, I think is very attractive. Lawyers are like this as well. And so um, I think this is a very, very interesting area where again, you can differentiate based on say your chunking strategy and your retrieval process for RAG to do that image or information compression very, very efficiently. So maybe you don't come up against that context window wall as much. Um, and yeah, so just in the last few minutes, I'd love to just say thanks for coming by. Uh, do feel free to do public Q&A here or just hit me up privately on John at Arthur at AI. Uh, and it's been great chatting. Um, Anonymous here asked, how does containerization work for LLMs with private data? Yeah, so I mean, if you're if you're... Um, if you're hosting your own LLM, right, that's exactly the same as just hosting a traditional machine learning model. So if you've containerized anything else, it'll be just like that, right? Like there's nothing, I think, once you're like, let's say once you have like a VPC uh, uh, where, um, uh, uh, like there, there's no difference between an LLM and a traditional ML model. So if you're running this in a, in a VPC, this is going to be the same. Or if you're, you know, running this entirely locally, this is going to be the same over here. It's just many of the different focuses, many of the different pain points uh, have changed a little bit because uh, we've sort of moved the world into natural language integration with these systems as opposed to some sort of code-based integration with these systems. But at the end of the day, you're, you're hitting, you know, you're hitting a database, you're hitting a vector database, and you're hitting a machine learning model or multiple machine learning models. And so that part actually hasn't changed that much. Uh, could you please provide some insights into Arthur's into how Arthur supports its finance customers with their LLM integration? Yeah, um, yeah, sure. So we've worked with many of the largest uh, banks in the U.S. Uh, for for multiple years now. So since before sort of LLMs, we have a lot of experience uh, with both uh, well cloud based or SaaS based deployments as well as um, sort of on prem deployments. Uh, unsurprisingly, when you when it comes to talking to, for example, finance customers or banks, um, you're often still hooked into on-prem. Although you'll hear across the board the C-suite saying that they're starting to embrace the cloud a bit more, um, and I think that actually is true. Uh, but you know, for many that that is in the future, and uh, the present, I'm sure for many of you as well, the present is uh, is is very very on-prem. Um, and so we do a couple of things. So one is when it comes to LLM integrations, uh, there it's still very, very early days, right? So um, many, many different uh, uh, individual teams within large, large, large financial institutions are building out their own LLM based, what I would call like almost demo applications right now. So you saw that quote, for example, that I had from somebody in the C-suite of the large banks, and they're rolling out 15 to 20 different chat apps within the next month. Those have all been created in the last year or so, right? Uh, evaluation is a big one there, right? So uh, that's one thing that Arthur does is, is you know, we, we help with evaluation and then we help with the monitoring aspect, the firewall aspects of that as well. 
So when that comes to, it's very early days for enterprise customers. When that comes to helping them define what tasks they care about, what pain points they care about, um, and then actually putting that into it, into production um, is is a journey for for most of these customers, right? There's a legal aspect to this where you know I still remember we we, we got one email that said something like, "Hey, uh, we can't put this into prod until you've dealt with bias and fairness," and that was like the entire email from from legal. And so this is a the bread and butter uh, uh, of a company like ours is you know that's always a discussion, right? These discussions around what robustness means, what fairness and bias means, what a good user experience means. And uh, you know we'll partner closely with enterprises to help them understand that. That's become very, very important because it's very, very early days for most of these applications across the board. Are there risks specifically related to LLMs hallucinating, giving wrong answers that are different for financial applications compared to other applications? That's a great question. And I'd, I'd love to hear some feedback on that as well. Um, one that we've seen, obviously, is, you know, when it comes to financial applications, um, uh, math just happens more, right? Like when it comes to like a you know, BTC um, sort of uh, uh, chat bot, uh, you'll often not ask questions like, uh, you know, what is what is the average, uh, whatever X is over the top 10 uh, of these companies uh, by market cap or something like that, right? Like this sort of like complex query against, uh, semi-structured data, right? So let's say that I ingest a bunch of financial documents uh, and I put those into some sort of data store or wherever. Um, so it's semi-structured, right? Like there's there's text in these as well as tabular data, as well as potentially even, you know, things like figures. Querying against that and asking a complex mathematical query against that, uh, this is a very tricky thing for LLMs to do still. And so th there's been some progress on uh, designing new architectures for LLMs to be able to do things like uh, well, symbolic reasoning, things like that. That's one. Two is, I think I made this comment earlier as well, uh, code execution and plugins, I think are going to play, well, they, they already do play a big role here. And I would argue that they play a bigger role here in finance and to some extent in legal than they do in many other parts of the world. LBS risks. Um, well, yeah, I mean, so risk for LLMs hallucinating, right? Like, uh, uh, there's a legal risk um, on 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 the financial side of things, right? If I if I um, misguide a customer, right? If I misguide a client using some sort of information that I gleaned through a summarization task through an LLM based system, uh, that could open me up to legal liability, right? So here's an anonymous comment: We were working with a customer in the contract management space where they had a requirement where they wanted LLMs to run through thousands of contract documents and be able to ask questions like which all contracts have the following clauses, uh, etc. Yeah, for sure. And so when you when you run into a case like that, right? Obviously, the retrieval strategy against against those documents is a huge one. But here's also like you you would you would you would benefit a lot from a larger context window size when you're talking about thousands or tens of thousands of. Uh, uh, clauses that are coming back, right? Because a clause is very different than asking for like particular rows and a piece of tabular data. A clause is going to, unless you do something smarter to it, take up a lot of that context window because it's going to be, let's say, 500 tokens per. Uh, any thoughts on lost in the middle, how language models use long contexts, fine tuning Llama for multi stage text retrieval, and whether upstart vector store providers with researchers knowing the ML side will have a compelling value prop? Yeah, great, 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 great question here. So um, lost in the middle, did that come out of Anthropic or was that primarily around Anthropic? I wish you could unmute. Um, but regardless, so the, the first paper that was referenced here, uh, I think references a, a larger uh, problem. So um, uh, I guess earlier this year, there were a couple of companies that put out pretty long context window models for the first time. So if I recall, I'm going to get the numbers a little bit wrong here, but like Mosaic put out a, a storytelling MPT uh, with, I think, a 65K context window. Anthropic uh, put out, a, I think, a 100K context window after that. And we've seen increases like this uh, over the, 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 the last few months as well. And there have been a bunch of questions about, you know, what, what's actually happening? Like, how are, they, how are they doing this? How are they using this? Uh, and uh, people did a bunch of, and I would argue that they're mostly gut check uh, checks against, say, Anthropics 100K, uh, showing that, um, or at least this is a hypothesis, showing that the middle of the, the context window basically got ignored or got, like, less attention than the edges, basically. Um, and uh, I remember, I think, reading into that a little bit at the time and believing it. Um, I'm sure that there's been a lot of work in that space since then, though. So I think that the jury's still a little bit out there. Um, 
Looks like we're at time, so I think we might have that be our last question. If that works for you, John? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know who asked this most recent question, but do feel free to, to email me at uh, johnandarthur.ai and we, we can keep chatting about this. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for coming and uh, pop by the Arthur offices in New York if you're ever around.